Welcome to the Beatitudes by Thomas Watson. We are continuing to read at page 185 for this reading. This Reformation MP3 audio resource is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Many free Puritan and Reformed resources, as well as our complete online catalog, containing classic and contemporary Reformation books, digital downloads, MP3s, videos, DVDs, CDs, and the Puritan hard drive at great discounts, are on the web at puritandownloads.com. Also, please consider, pray, and act upon the important truths found in the following quotation by Charles Spurgeon. Quote, As the Apostle says to Timothy, so also he says to everyone, Give yourself to reading. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. The best way for you to spend your leisure is to be either reading or praying. End of quote. If you'd like to be added to our email list, please send us an email at swrb at swrb.com with the word add in the subject line. Our email list is a double opt-in list, so once you've sent us your email address, you'll be asked by email to confirm that you want to join our list using the email address that you've supplied. Your email information will be kept confidential, and you can easily remove yourself from our email list by simply emailing us at swrb at swrb.com with the word remove in the subject line. Once you're on our email list, you'll be alerted to all the new free Reformation resources, free MP3s, free electronic books and texts and so forth. SWRB makes these available on the web, and uh, as well as uh, times of discounts and super specials you'll be told about. We also encourage you to reproduce this audio resource and to pass it on to your friends but we only authorize this as long as the full contents of the message, including the header and trailer, is not altered in any way, and as long as the audio file is given away for free. And now, to SWRB's reading of the Beatitudes by Thomas Watson, which we hope you find to be a great blessing, and which we pray draws you nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John fourteen six. As we said, we're on page 185. We were talking about seven signs of a pure heart. The fourth one being that a pure heart avoids the appearance of evil. Abstain from all show of evil, 1 Thessalonians five twenty two. A pure heart avoids that which may be interpreted as evil. He that is loyal to his prince not only forbears to have his hand in treason, but he takes heed of that which has a show of treason. A gracious heart is shy of that which looks like sin. When Joseph's mistress took hold of him and said, Lie with me, he left his garment in her hand and fled from her. Genesis 39.12 He avoided the appearance of evil. He would not be seen in her company. And thus a pure heart avoids whatever may have the suspicion of sin uh, in regard of himself, firstly, and, and that two ways. First, because the appearance of evil is oftentimes an occasion of evil. Effeminate dalliance is an appearance of evil, and many times occasions evil. Had Joseph been familiar with his mistress in a wanton, sporting manner, he might in time have been drawn to commit folly with her. Some, out of novelty and curiosity, have gone to hear Mass. Afterwards, have lent the idol not only their ear, but their knee. In our times, are there not many who have gone with itching ears into sectarian company and have come home with the plague in their head? When Dinah would be gadding, she lost her chastity, Genesis 34, 2. A pure heart foreseeing the danger avoids the appearance of evil. It is dangerous to go near a hornet's nest. The men who went near the furnace were burned, Daniel 3.22. Second, because the appearance of evil may eclipse his good name. A good name is a precious ointment. 
It's better than fine gold, Proverbs 22.1. It commends us to God and angels, which riches cannot do. Now a godly man avoids the appearance of evil, lest he wound his good name. What comfort can there be of life when the name lies buried? Secondly, a pure heart avoids the suspicion of sin out of reverence and respect to the holiness of God. God hates the very appearance of evil. God abhors hypocrites because they have no more than the appearance of good. But he is angry with his children if they have so much as the appearance of evil. A gracious heart knows God is a jealous God and cannot endure that his people should border upon sin. Therefore he keeps aloof off and will not come near the smell of infection. Thirdly, a pure heart avoids the show of sin in regard of the godly. The appearance of evil may scandalize a weak brother. A gracious heart is not only fearful lest he should defile his own conscience, but lest he should offend his brother's conscience. Were it only a thing indifferent, yet if it be an appearance of evil and may grieve another, we are to forbear. 1 Corinthians 10, 25-28 For when we sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, we sin against Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 8.12. The weak Christian is a member of Christ. Therefore, the sinning against a member is a sinning against Christ. Fourthly, a pure heart avoids the very appearance of evil in regard of the wicked. The apostle would have us walk wisely toward them that are without. 1 Thessalonians 4.12. The wicked watch for our halting. How glad would they be of anything to reproach religion? Professors are placed as stars in the highest orb of the church, and if there be but the appearance of any eccentric or irregular motion, the wicked would presently open their mouths with a fresh cry against religion. Now to a godly heart, the fame and honor of the gospel is so dear that he had rather die than impeach or eclipse it. By this, then, let us try ourselves whether we are pure in heart. Do we avoid the least apparition of sin? Alas, how many run themselves into the occasions of sin. They tempt the devil to tempt them. Some go to masks and comedies, the, the very fuel and temptation to lust. Others frequent erroneous meetings. And truly God often in just judgment leaves them to the acts of sin and that do not avoid the appearance of sin. They were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, Psalm 106.35. Pure hearts fly the occasion. John would not endure the company of Serinthus in the bath, as Nicephorus notes. Polycarp would have no conference with Marcion, the, the heretic, who called him the devil's firstborn. Basil says that the Christians in his time avoided the meetings of sectaries as the very schools of error. Oh, avoid the appearance of evil. The Apostle bids us to follow these things which are of good report. Philippians 4, 8. 5. A pure heart performs holy duties in, an un, in a holy manner. This holy manner, or due order, consists in three things. First, preparing the heart before a duty. An unholy heart does not care how it rushes upon an ordinance. It comes without preparation and goes away without profit. The pure heart is a prepared heart. It dresses itself before it comes to a duty, by examination and ejaculation. When the earth is prepared, then it is fit to receive the seed. When the instrument is prepared and tuned, it is fit for music. Secondly, watching the heart in a duty. A holy heart labors to be affected and wrought upon. His heart burns within him. There was no sacrifice without fire. A pure saint labors to have his heart broken in a duty. Psalm 51, 17. The incense, when it was broken, cast the sweetest savor. Impure souls care not in what a dead or perfunctory manner they serve God. Ezekiel 33, 31. They pray more out of fashion than out of faith. They are no more afraid with or affected with an ordinance than the tombs of the church. 
God complains of offering up the blind, Malachi 1.8. Is it not as bad to offer up the dead? O oh, Christian, say to yourself, how can this deadness of heart stand with pureness of heart? Do not dead things putrefy? Thirdly, outward reverence. Purity of heart will express itself by the reverend gesture of the body, the lifting up of the eye and hand, the uncovering the head, the bending the knee. Constantine the emperor bore great reverence to the word. When God gave the law, the mount was on fire and trembled, Exodus 19.18. The reason was that the people might prostrate themselves more reverently before the Lord. The ark, wherein the law was put, was carried upon bars that the Levites might not touch it, Exodus 25, 11 and 14. To show what reverence God would have about holy things, sitting in prayer, unless in case of weakness, and having the hat half on in prayer, is a very indecent, irreverent practice. And let such as are guilty reform it. We must not only offer up our souls, but our bodies, Romans 12, 1. The Lord takes notice what posture and gesture we use in his worship. If a man were to deliver a petition to the king, would he deliver it with his hat half on? The careless irreverence of some would make us think that they did not much regard whether God heard them or not. We are run from one extreme to another, from superstition to unmannerliness. Let Christians think of the dreadful majesty of God who is present. How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven, Genesis 28:17. The blessed angels cover their faces, crying, Holy, 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 Isaiah 6, 3. A holy heart will have a holy gesture. 6. A pure heart will have a pure life. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Where there is a good conscience, there will be a good conversation. Some bless God, they have good hearts, but their lives are evil. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30, 12. If the stream be corrupt, we may suspect the spring head to be impure. Aaron was called the saint of the Lord, Psalm 106.16. He had not only a holy heart, but there was a golden plate on his forehead on which was written holiness to the Lord. Purity must not only be woven into the heart, but engraven upon the life. Grace is most beautiful when it shines abroad with its golden beams. The clock has not only its motion within, but the finger moves without upon the dial. Pureness of heart shows itself upon the dial of the conversation. Uh, a pure soul talks of God, Psalm 37:30. His heart is seen in his tongue. The Latins call the roof of the mouth calum, or heaven. He that is pure in heart, his mouth is full of heaven. And he walks with God, Genesis 6, 9. He's still doing angels' work, praising God, serving God. He lives as Christ did upon earth. Holy duties are the Jacob's ladder by which he is still ascending to heaven. Purity of heart and life are in Scripture made twins. I will put my spirit within you, Ezekiel 36, 27. There is purity of heart. And cause you to walk in my statutes. Now there is purity of life. Shall we account them pure, whose conversation is not in heaven, Philippians 3.20, but rather in hell? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights, Micah 6.11? How justly may others reproach religion when they see it kicked down with our unholy feet. Pure heart has a golden frontispiece. Grace, like new wine, will have vent. It, it can be no more concealed than lost. The saints are called jewels, Malachi 3.17, because of that shining luster they cast in the eyes of others. And number seven, a pure heart is so in love with purity that nothing can draw him off from it. Uh, 
Let others reproach purity. He loves it. As David, when he danced before the ark, and Michael scoffed, If, says he, this be to be vile, I will be more vile. Second Samuel 6.22 So says a pure heart. If to follow after holiness is to be vile, I will yet be more vile. Let water be sprinkled upon the fire, it burns the more. The more others deride holiness, the more a gracious soul burns in love and zeal to it. If a man had an inheritance befallen him, would he be laughed out of it? What is a Christian the worse for another's reproach? A blind man's disparaging a diamond does not make it sparkle the less. And let others persecute holiness, a pure heart will pursue it. Holiness is the queen every gracious soul is espoused to, and he will rather die than be divorced. Paul would be holy, though bonds and persecutions did abide him, Acts 20, 23. The way of religion is often thorny and bloody, but a gracious heart prefers inward purity before outward peace. I have heard of one who, having a jewel he much prized, the king sent for his jewel. Tell the king, says he, I honor his majesty, but I will rather lose my life than part with my jewel. He who is enriched with the jewel of holiness will rather die than part with this jewel. When his honor and riches will do him no good, his holiness will stand him instead. You have your fruit under holiness and the end, everlasting life. And now nine exhortations to heart purity. Let me persuade Christians to heart purity. The harlot wipes her mouth, Proverbs thirty twenty. but that's not enough. Wash thine heart, O Jerusalem, Jeremiah four fourteen. And here I shall lay down some arguments or motives to persuade it to heart purity. First, the necessity of heart purity. It is necessary, first, in respect of ourselves. Till the heart be pure, all our holy things are polluted. They are splendid sins. To the unclean, all things are unclean. Titus 1.15 Their offering is unclean. Under the law, if a man who was unclean by a dead body carried a piece of holy flesh in his skirt, the holy flesh could not cleanse him, but he polluted that. Haggai 2, 12 and 13. He who had the leprosy, whatever he touched, was unclean. If he had touched the altar or sacrificed, the altar had not cleansed him, but he had defiled the altar. A foul hand defiles the purest water. An impure heart defiles prayers, sacraments. He drops poison upon all. A pure stream running through muddy ground is polluted. The holiest ordinances are stained, running through an impure heart. A sinner's works are called dead works, Hebrews 6, 1. And those whose works uh, which are dead cannot please God. A dead wife cannot please her husband. Secondly, heart purity is necessary in respect of God. God is holy. Purity is the chief robe wherewith God himself is clothed. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Habakkuk 1.13 and will this holy God endure to have an impure heart come near him? Will a man lay a viper in his bosom? The holy God and the sinner cannot dwell together. None can dwell together but friends, but there is no friendship between God and the sinner, both of them being of a contrary judgment and disposition. An impure heart is more odious to God than a serpent. God gave the serpent its venom, but Satan fills the heart with sin. Why hath Satan filled thine heart? Acts 5, 3. The Lord abhors a sinner. He will not come near him, having his plague sores running. My soul loathed them, Zechariah 11, 8. Thirdly, heart purity is necessary in regard of angels. They are pure creatures. The angels, the cherubims, which typified the angels, were made of fine gold to denote the purity of their essence. No unholy thought enters into the angels. Therefore, there must be purity of heart, that there may be some resemblance between us and them. 
What should unholy hearts do among those pure angelical spirits? Fourthly, in regard of the saints glorified. They are pure, being refined from all lees and dregs of sin. Their title is Spirits of Just Men Made Perfect, Hebrews 12.23. Now, what should profane spirits do among spirits made perfect? I tell you, if you who wallow in your sins could come near God and angels and spirits of men made perfect and have a sight of their luster, you would soon wish yourselves out of their company. As a man that is dirty and in his rags, if he should stand before the king and his nobles, and see them glistering in their cloth of gold, sparkling with their jewels, he'd be ashamed of himself, wish himself out of their presence. Fifthly, there must be heart purity in regard of heaven. Heaven is a pure place. It's an inheritance undefiled, First Peter 1, 4. No unclean beasts come into the heavenly ark. There shall not enter into it Anything that defileth, Revelation twenty one twenty seven, The Lord will not put the new wine of glory into a musty, impure heart, all which considered shows the necessity of heart purity. Secondly, it is the will of God that we should be pure in heart. This is the will of God, your sanctification. First Thessalonians 4, 3. Are you low in the world? Perhaps it is not the will of God that you should be rich, but it is the will of God that you should be holy. This is the will of God, your sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Let God have his will by being holy, and you shall have your will by being happy. God's will must either be fulfilled by us or upon us. Number three, purity of heart is the characteristic note of God's people. God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Psalm 73, 1. Heart purity denominates us the Israel of God. It is not profession which makes us the Israel of God. It makes us of Israel indeed, but all are not Israel which are of Israel. Romans 9, 6. Purity of heart is the jewel which is hung only upon the elect. As chastity distinguishes a virtuous woman from a harlot, so the true saint is distinguished from the hypocrite by his heart purity. This is like the nobleman's star or garter, which is a peculiar ensign of honor, differing him from the vulgar. When the bright star of purity shines in a Christian's heart, it distinguishes him from a formal professor. Number four, purity of heart makes us like God. It was Adam's unhappiness once that he aspired to be like God in omnisciency, but we must endeavor to be like God in sanctity. God's image consists in holiness. To those who do not have this image and superscription upon them, he will say, I know you not. God delights in no heart but where he may see his own face and likeness. You cannot see your face in a glass when it is dusty. God's face cannot be seen in a dusty, impure soul. A pure heart, like a clean glass or mirror, gives forth some idea and representation of God. There's little comfort in being like God in other things besides purity. Are we like God in that we have a being? Well, so have stones. Are we like him in that we have motion? Uh, so have stars. Are we like him in that we have life? Well, so have trees and birds. Are we like him in that we have knowledge? So have devils. There is no likeness to God. will prove comfortable and blissful, but our being like him in purity. God loves the pure in heart. Love is founded upon likeness. Number five, the excellency of the heart lies in the purity of it. Purity was the glory of the soul in innocency. The purer a thing is, the better. The purer the air is, and the more free from noxious vapors, the better it is. The spirits of water distilled are most precious. The purer the gold is, the more valuable. The purer the wine is when it is taken off from the lees and dregs, the more excellent it is. The more the soul is clarified by grace and taken off from the lees and dregs of sin, the more precious account God makes of it. 
The purer the heart is, the more spiritual it is, and the more spiritual, the more fit to entertain him who is a spirit. Number six, God is good to the pure in heart. God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Psalm 73, 1. We all desire that God should be good to us. It's the sick man's prayer, the Lord be good to me. God is good to such as are of a clean heart. But how is God good to them? Two ways. First, to them that are pure, all things are sanctified. To the pure, all things are pure. Titus 1.15 Estate is sanctified. Relations are sanctified. As the temple sanctified the gold and the altar sanctified the offering. To the unclean, nothing is clean. Their table is a snare. Their temple devotion is sin. There's a curse entailed upon a wicked man, Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 20. But holiness removes the curse and cuts off the entail. To the pure, all things are pure. And secondly, the pure hearted have all things work for their good, Romans 8, 28. Mercies and afflictions shall turn to their good. The most poisonful drug shall be medicinable. The most cross providence shall carry on the design of their salvation. Who then would not be pure in heart? God is good to such as are of a clean heart. Number seven, heart purity makes way for heaven. The pure in heart shall see God. Happiness is nothing but the quintessence of holiness. Purity of heart is heaven begun in a man. Holiness is called in scripture the anointing of God, 1 John 2:27. Solomon was first anointed with the holy oil, then he was made king. 1 Kings 1.39 The people of God are first anointed with the oil of the Spirit and made pure in heart, and then the crown of glory is set upon their head. And is not purity to be highly valued? It lays a train for glory. Purity of heart and seeing of God are linked together. Number eight, note the examples of those who have been eminent for heart purity. The Lord Jesus was a pattern of purity. Which of you convinceth me of sin? John 8, 46. In this, we are to imitate Christ. We are not to imitate him in raising the dead or in working miracles, but in being holy. 1 Peter 1, 16. Besides this golden pattern of Christ, we are to write after the fair copy of those saints who have been of a dove-like purity. David was so pure in heart that he was a man after God's heart. Abraham was so purified by faith that he was one of God's cabinet council. Genesis 18:17. Moses was so holy that God spake with him face to face. What were the rest of the patriarchs but so many plants of renown flourishing in holiness? The fathers in the primitive church were exemplary for purity. Gregory Nazianzen, Basil, Augustine, they were so inlaid and adorned with purity that envy itself could not tax them. Therefore, as Caesar wished he had such soldiers as were in the time of Alexander the Great, so we may wish we had such saints as were in the primitive times. So just were they in their dealings, so decent in their attire, so true in their promises, so devout in their religion, so unblameable in their lives that they were living sermons, walking Bibles, real pictures of Christ, and helped to keep up the credit of godliness in the world. And number nine, heart purity is the only jewel you can carry out of the world. Have you a child you delight in or an estate? You can carry nothing out of the world. First Timothy 6, 7. Purity of heart is the only commodity that can be with comfort transported. This is that will stay longest with you. Usually we love those things which last longest. We prize a diamond or a piece of gold above the most beautiful flower because fading. Heart purity has perpetuity. It will go with us beyond the grave. And now eight means to be used to obtain heart purity. How shall we obtain to heart purity? Number one, often look into the word of God. Now you are clean through the word, John 15:3. Thy word is very pure, Psalm 119, 140. God's word is pure, not only for the matter of it, but the effect, because it makes us pure. 
sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth john seventeen seventeen by looking into this pure crystal we are changed into the image of it the word is both a mirror to show us the spots of our souls and a laver to wash them away the word breathes nothing but purity it irradiates the mind it consecrates the heart secondly go to the bath there are two baths christians should wash in first the bath of tears go into this bath peter had sullied and defiled himself with sin and he washed himself with penitential tears mary magdalene who was an impure sinner stood at jesus feet weeping luke seven thirty eight mary's tears washed her heart as well as christ's feet O oh, sinners, let your eyes be a fountain of tears. Weep for those sins which are so many as have passed all arithmetic. <clears throat> this water of contrition, contrition is healing and purifying. Secondly, the bath of Christ's blood. This is that fountain opened for sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13.1 A soul steeped in the brinish tears of repentance and bathed in the blood of Christ is made pure. This is that spiritual washing. All the legal washings and purifications were but types and emblems representing Christ's blood. This blood lays the soul a whitening. Number three, get faith. It's a soul cleansing grace. Having purified their hearts by faith, Acts 15, 9. The woman in the gospel that but touched the hem of Christ's garment was healed. A touch of faith heals. If I believe Christ and all his merits are mine, how can I sin against him? We do not willingly injure those friends who we believe love us. Nothing can have a greater force and efficacy upon the heart to make it pure than faith. Faith will remove mountains, the mountains of pride, lust, envy. Faith and the love of sin are inconsistent. Number four, breathe after the Spirit. He is called the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. It purgeth the heart as lightning purgeth the air, that we may see what a purifying virtue the Spirit has. It is compared, number one, to fire, Acts 2.3, fires of a purifying nature. It refines and cleans metals. It separates the dross from the gold. The Spirit of God in the heart refines and sanctifies it. It burns up the dross of sin. Secondly, the Spirit is compared to wind. There came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 2-4. The wind purifies the air. When the air, by reason of foggy vapors, is unwholesome, the wind is a fan to winnow and purify it. Thus, when the vapors of sin arise in the heart, vapors of pride and covetousness, earthly vapors, the Spirit of God arises and blows upon the soul, and so purges away these impure vapors. The spouse in the Song of Solomon prays for a gale of the Spirit that she might be made pure. That's in 4.16. The third, the Spirit is compared to water. He that believes on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the spirit john seven thirty eight thirty nine the spirit is like water not only to make the soul fruitful for it causes the desert to bloom as the rose isaiah thirty two fifteen and thirty five one but the spirit is like water to purify whereas before the heart of a sinner was unclean and whatever he touched had a tincture of impurity numbers 19:22 when once the spirit comes into the heart it does uh, with its continual showers wash off the filthiness of it making it pure and fit for the god of spirits to dwell in number 5 take heed of familiar converse and intercourse with the wicked one vain mind makes another one hard heart makes another. The stone in the body is not infectious, but the stone in the heart is. One profane spirit poisons another. Beware of the society of the wicked. Some may object, but, but what hurt is in this? Did not Jesus converse with sinners? Luke 5.29 First, there was a necessity for that. If Jesus had not come among sinners, 
How could any have been saved? He went among sinners not to join with them in their sins. He was not a companion of sinners, but a physician of sinners. And two, though Christ did converse with sinners, he could not be polluted with their sin. His divine nature was a sufficient antidote to preserve him from infection. Christ could be no more defiled with their sin than the sun is defiled by shining on a dunghill. Sin could no more stick on Christ than a burr on a mirror of crystal. The soil of his heart was so pure that no viper of sin could breed there. But the case is altered with us. We have a stock of corruption within, and the least thing will increase this stock. Therefore it is dangerous mingling ourselves among the wicked. If we would be pure in heart, let us shun their society. He that would preserve his garment clean avoids the dirt. The wicked are as the mire. Isaiah 57:20. The fresh waters running among the salt taste brackish. Number six, if you would be pure, walk with them that are pure. As the communion of the saints is in our creed, so it should be in our company. He that walketh with the wise shall be wise. Proverbs 13, 20. And he that walketh with the pure shall be pure. The saints are like a bed of spices. By intermixing ourselves with them, we shall partake of their savoriness. Association begets assimilation. Sometimes God blesses good society to the conversion of others. Number seven, wait at the posts of wisdom's door. Reverence the word preached. The word of God sucked in by faith, Hebrews 4, 2, transforms the heart into the likeness of it, Romans six seventeen. The word is a holy seed, James 1, 18, which being cast into the heart makes it partake of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. And number eight, pray for heart purity. Job propounds the question, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Job 14.4 and 15.14. God can do it. Out of an impure heart, he can produce grace. Pray that prayer of David, create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 51.10. Most men pray more for full purses than pure hearts. We should pray for heart purity fervently. It is a matter we are most nearly concerned in. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12:14. Our prayer must be with sighs and groans. Romans 8:23 to 26. There must not only be elocution, but affection. Jacob wrestled in prayer. Genesis 32:24. Hannah poured out her soul. 1 Samuel 1:15. We often pray so coldly our petitions even freezing between our lips, as if we would teach God to deny. We pray as if we cared not whether God heard us or no. O oh, Christian, be earnest with God for a pure heart. Lay your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, thou who hast given me a heart, give me a pure heart. My heart is good for nothing as it is. It defiles everything it touches. Lord, I am not fit to live with this heart. For I cannot honor thee, nor to die with it, for I cannot see thee. O oh, purge me with hyssop. Let Christ's blood be sprinkled upon me. Let the Holy Ghost descend upon me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Thou who bidst me give thee my heart, Lord, make my heart pure, and thou shalt have it. We now move to chapter 17. The blessed privilege of seeing God explained they shall see god matthew 5 8 the sight of god in this life and in the life to come these words are linked to the former and they are a great incentive to heart purity the pure heart shall see the pure god there is a double sight which the saints have of god number one in this life that is, spiritually, by the eye of faith. Faith sees God's glorious attributes in the mirror of his word. Faith beholds him showing forth himself through the lattice of his ordinances. Thus Moses saw him who was invisible. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Believers see God's glory as it were veiled over. 
they behold his back parts, Exodus 33, 23. And then secondly, in the life to come. And this glorious sight is meant in the text, they shall see God. A pleasant prospect. This divines call the beatifical vision. At that day, the veil will be pulled off. And God will show himself in all his glory to the soul as a king on a day of coronation shows himself in all his royalty and magnificence. This sight of God will be the heaven of heaven. We shall indeed have a sight of angels, and that will be sweet. But the quintessence of happiness and the diamond in the ring will be this. We shall see God. If the sun be absent, it is night for all the stars. The angels are called stars, Job 38, 7. But it would be night in heaven if the sun of righteousness did not shine there. It is the king's presence makes the court. Absalom counted himself half alive unless he might see the king's face, 2 Samuel 14, 32. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This sight of God in glory is, first, partly mental and intellectual. We shall see him with the eyes of our mind. If there be not an intellectual sight of God, how do the spirits of just men made perfect see him? But second, it is partly corporeal. Not that we can with bodily eyes behold the bright essence of God. Indeed, uh, there are those who erroneously hold that God had a visible shape and figure. As man was made in God's image, so they thought that God was made in man's image. But God is a spirit, John 4.24, and being a spirit is invisible. 1 Timothy 1.17, he cannot be beheld by bodily eyes, whom no man has seen nor can see, 1 Timothy 6.16. A sight of his glory would overwhelm us. This wine is too strong for our weak heads. But when I say our seeing of God in heaven is corporeal, my meaning is that we shall with bodily eyes behold Jesus Christ, through whom the glory of God, his wisdom, holiness, and mercy shall shine forth to the soul. Put a back of steel to the mirror, you can see a face in it. So the human nature of Christ is, as it were, a back of steel through which we may see the glory of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. In this sense, that scripture is to be understood with these eyes, Shall I see God? Job nineteen, twenty six and twenty seven. Here are nine excellencies of the beatific vision. Now, concerning this blessed sight of God, it is so sublime and sweet that I can but draw a dark shadow of it. We shall better understand it when we come to heaven. Only at present I shall lay down these nine aphorisms or maxims first. Our sight of God in heaven shall be a transparent sight. Here we see him through a mirror darkly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But through Christ we shall behold God in a very illustrious manner. God will unveil himself and show forth his glory so far as the soul is capable to receive. If Adam had not sinned, yet it is Probable he should have never have had such a clear sight of God as the saints in glory shall have. We shall see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. Now we see him as he is not. He is not mutable, not mortal. There we shall see him as he is in a very transparent manner. Then shall I know, even as also I am known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. That is, clearly. Does not God know us clearly and fully? Then shall the saints know him, according to their capacity, as they are known. As their love to God, so their sight of God shall be perfect. Number two, this sight of God will be a transcendent sight. It will surpass in glory. Such Glittering beams shall sparkle forth from the Lord Jesus as shall infinitely amaze and delight the eyes of the beholders. Imagine what a blessed sight it will be to see Christ wearing the robe of our human nature and to see that nature sitting in glory above the angels. If God be so beautiful here, 
in his ordinances, word, prayer, sacraments, if there be such excellency in him when we see him by the eye of faith through the perspective glass of a promise, oh, what will it be when we shall see him face to face? When Christ was transfigured on the mount, he was full of glory, Matthew 17, 2. If his transfiguration were so glorious, what will his inauguration be? What a glorious time will it be when, as it was said of Mordecai, we shall see him in the presence of his father, arrayed in royal apparel and with a great crown of gold upon his head, Esther 8.15. There will be glory beyond hyperbole. If the sun were 10,000 times brighter than it is, it could not so much as shadow out this glory. In the heavenly horizon we behold beauty, in its first magnitude and highest elevation. There we shall see the king in his glory, Isaiah thirty-three seventeen. All lights are but eclipses compared with that glorious vision. Apelles' pencil would blot. Angels' tongues would but disparage it. Number three, this sight of God will be a transforming sight. We shall be like him, 1 John 3, 2. The saints shall be changed into glory. As when the light springs into a dark room, the room may be said to be changed from what it was. The saints shall so see God as to be changed into his image. Psalm seventeen fifteen. Here, God's people are blackened and sullied with infirmities. But in heaven, they shall be as the dove covered with silver wings. They shall have some rays and beams of God's glory shining in them as a man that rolls himself in the snow, is of a snow-like whiteness, as the crystal by having the sunshine on it sparkles and looks like the sun. So the saints, by beholding the brightness of God's glory, shall have a tincture of that glory upon them. Not that they shall partake of God's very essence, for as the iron in the fire becomes fire, yet remains iron still, so the saints, by beholding the luster of God's majesty, shall be glorious creatures, but yet creatures still. Number four, this sight of God will be a joyful sight. Thou shalt make me glad with the light of thy countenance. Acts 2, 28. After a sharp winter, how pleasant will it be to see the Son of Righteousness displaying himself in all his glory. Thus faith breed joy, in whom, though now we see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, First Peter 1, 8. If the joy of faith be such, what will the joy of vision be? The sight of Christ will amaze the eye with wonder and ravish the heart with joy. If the face of a friend whom we entirely love so affects us and drives away sorrow, oh, how cheering will the sight of God be to the saints in heaven. Then indeed it may be said, your heart shall rejoice, John 16, 22. There are two things which will make the saints' vision of God in heaven joyful. First, through Jesus Christ, the dread and terror of the divine essence shall be taken away. Majesty shall appear in God to preserve reverence, but withal majesty clothed with beauty and tempered with sweetness to excite joy in the saints. We shall see God as a friend, not as guilty Adam did, who was afraid and hid himself, Genesis 3.10, but as Queen Esther looked upon King Ahasuerus, holding forth the golden scepter, Esther 5.2. Surely this sight of God will not be formidable, but comfortable. And secondly, the saints shall not only have vision, but fruition. They shall so see God as to enjoy him. Aquinas and Scotus dispute the case whether the formalis ratio, the, the very formality and essence of blessedness, be an act of the understanding or the will. Aquinas says that happiness consists in the intellectual part, the bare seeing of God. Scotus says that happiness is an act of the will, the enjoying of God. But certainly, true blessedness comprehends both. It lies partly in the understanding, by seeing the glory of God richly displayed, and partly in the will, by a sweet, delicious taste of it, 
and acquiescence of the soul in it. We shall so seek God as to love Him, and so love Him as to be filled with Him. The seeing of God implies fruition. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew twenty five twenty one. Not only behold it, but enter into it. In thy light we shall see light. Psalm 36, 9. There is vision. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm sixteen eleven. There is fruition. So great is the joy which flows from the sight of God as will make the saints break forth into triumphant praises and hallelujahs. Number five, this sight of God will be a satisfying sight. Cast three worlds into the heart and they will not fill it, but the sight of God satisfies. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness, Psalm 17, 15. Solomon says the eye is not satisfied with seeing, Ecclesiastes 1, 8. But there the eye will be satisfied with seeing. God and nothing but God can satisfy. The saints shall have their heads so full of knowledge and their hearts so full of joy that they shall find no want. Number six, it will be an unweariable sight let a man see the rarest sight that is, he will soon be cloyed. When he comes into a garden and sees delicious walks, fair arbors, pleasant flowers, within a little while he grows weary. But it's not so in heaven. There is no surfeit. We shall never be weary of seeing God. For the divine essence being infinite, there shall be every moment new and fresh delights springing forth from God into the glorified soul. The soul shall not so desire God, but it shall still be full. Nor shall it be so full that it shall not that it shall still desire. So sweet will God be that the more the saints behold God, the more they will be ravished with desire and delight. Number seven, it will be a beneficial sight. It will tend to the bettering and advantaging of the soul. Some colors, while they delight the eyes, hurt them. But this intuition and vision of God shall better the soul and tend to its infinite happiness. Eve's looking upon the tree of knowledge prejudiced her sight. She afterwards grew blind upon it, but the saints can receive no detriment from the inspection of glory. This sight will be beneficial. The soul will never be in its perfection till it comes to see God. This will be the crowning blessing. Number eight, this sight of God shall be perpetuated. Here we see objects a while, and then our eyes grow dim and we need spectacles. But the saints shall always behold God. As there shall be no cloud upon God's face, so the saints shall have no mote in their eye. Their sight shall never grow dim, but they shall be to all eternity looking on God, that beautiful and beatifical object. Oh, what a soul-ravishing sight this will be. God must make us able to bear it. We can no more endure a sight of glory than a sight of wrath. But the saints after this life shall have their capacities enlarged, and they shall be qualified and made fit to receive the penetrating beams of glory. Number nine, it will be a speedy sight. There are some who deny that the soul is immediately after death admitted to the sight of God. But I shall make good this assertion, that the saints shall have an immediate transition and passage from death to glory. As soon as death has closed their eyes, they shall see God. If the soul be not presently after death translated to the beatifical vision, then what becomes of the soul in that juncture of time to the resurrection? Does the soul go into torment? That cannot be, for the soul of a believer is a member of Christ's body mystical. And if this soul should go to hell, a member of Christ might be for a time damned, but that's impossible. Does the soul sleep in the body, as some drowsily imagine? How then shall we make good sense of that scripture? We are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, Second Corinthians 5, 8. If the soul at death be absent from the body, then it cannot sleep in the body. Does the soul die? So that Lucianus held that the soul was mortal and died with the body. But as Scalinger observes, it's impossible 
that the soul, being of a spiritual, uncompounded nature, should be subject to corruptibility. Such as say the soul dies, I would demand of them wherein the soul of a man differs at death from the soul of a brute, by all which it appears that the soul of a believer after death goes immediately to God. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise, Luke twenty three forty three. That word with me shows clearly that the thief on the cross was translated to heaven, for there Christ was. Ephesians 4, 10. And the word this day shows that the thief on the cross had an immediate passage from the cross to paradise so that the souls of believers have a speedy vision of God after death. It is but winking, and then they shall see God. It is the sinner's misery that he shall not see God. See the misery of an impure sinner. He shall not be admitted to the sight of God. The pure in heart only shall see God. Such as live in sin, whose souls are dyed black with the filth of hell, they shall never come where God is. They shall have an affrighting vision of God, but not a beatifical vision. They shall see the flaming sword and the burning lake, but not the mercy seat. God in Scripture is sometimes called a consuming fire, sometimes the father of lights. The wicked shall feel the fire, but not see the light. Impure souls shall be covered with shame and darkness as with a mantle, and shall never see the king's face. They who would not see God in his ordinances shall not see him in his glory. We must labor to be rightly qualified for this vision. Is there such a blessed privilege after this life? Then let me persuade all who hear me this day, number one, to get into Christ. We cannot come to God but by Christ. Moses, when he was in the rock, saw God. Exodus 33:32. In this blessed rock, Christ, we shall see God. Number two, to be purified persons. It is only the pure in heart who shall see God. It's only a clear eye can behold a bright, transparent object. Those only who have their hearts cleansed from sin can have this blessed sight of God. Sin is such a cloud as, if it be not removed, will forever hinder us from seeing the Son of Righteousness. Christian, have you upon your heart holiness to the Lord? Then you shall see God. There are many, says Augustine, could be content to go to heaven, but they are loath to take away the sin that leads thither. They would have the glorious vision, but neglect the gracious union. There are several sorts of eyes which shall never see God. The ignorant eye, the unchaste eye, the scornful eye, the malicious eye, the covetous eye. If you would see God when you die, you must be purified persons while you live. We shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. First John 3, verses 2 and 3. Now let me turn myself to the pure in heart. First, stand amazed at this privilege, that you who are worms crept out of the dust should be admitted to the blessed sight of God to all eternity. It was Moses' prayer. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Exodus 33:18. The saints shall behold God's glory. The pure in heart shall have the same blessedness that God himself has. For what is the blessedness of God but the contemplating his own infinite beauty? Number two, begin your sight of God here. Let the eye of your faith be still upon God. Moses by faith saw him who is invisible. Hebrews 11:27 Often look upon him with believing eyes whom you hope to see with glorified eyes Mine eyes are ever towards the Lord Psalm 25:15 While others are looking towards the earth as if they would fetch all their comforts thence let us look up to heaven There's the best prospect the sight of God by faith would let in much joy to the soul Though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable. 1 Peter 1, 8. Number three, let this be as medicinal water to revive the pure in heart. 
Be comforted with this. You shall shortly see God. The godly have many sights here that they would not see. They see a body of death. They see the sword unsheathed. They see rebellion wearing the mask of religion. They see the white devil. These sights occasion sorrow. But there is a blessed sight a coming. They shall see God. And in him are all sparkling beauties and ravishing joys to be found. Number four, be not discouraged at sufferings. All the hurt that affliction and death can do is to give you a sight of God. As one said to his fellow martyr, one half hour in glory will make us forget our pain. The sun arising, all the dark shadows of the night fly away. When the pleasant beams of God's countenance shall begin to shine upon the soul in heaven, then sorrows and sufferings shall be no more. The dark shadows of the night shall fly away. The thoughts of this beatifical vision should carry a Christian full sail with joy through the waters of affliction. This made Job so willing to embrace death. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job 19, 25 and 26. Let's move on to chapter 18 concerning peaceableness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9. This is the seventh step of the golden ladder which leads to blessedness. The name of peace is sweet and the work of peace is a blessed work. Blessed are the peacemakers. Observe the connection. The scripture links these two together, pureness of heart and peaceableness of spirit. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. James 3.17. Follow peace and holiness. Hebrews 12.14. And here Christ joins them together, pure in heart and peacemakers, as if there could be no purity where there is not a study of peace. That religion is suspicious, which is full of faction and discord. In the words, there are three parts. First, a duty implied, namely peaceable mindedness. Two, a duty expressed to be peacemakers. And third, a title of honor bestowed. They shall be called the children of God. First, the duty implied, peaceable mindedness. For before men can make peace among others, they must be of peaceable spirits themselves. Before they can be promoters of peace, they must be lovers of peace. Christians must be peaceable-minded. This peaceableness of spirit is the beauty of a saint. It's a jewel of great price, the ornament of a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price, First Peter 3, 4. The saints are Christ's sheep, John 10, 27. The sheep is a peaceable creature. Or they are Christ's dove, Song of Solomon 2, 14. Therefore they must be without gall. It becomes not Christians to be Ishmael's, but Solomon's, though they must be lions for courage, yet lambs for peaceableness. God was not in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but in the still, small voice, 1 Kings 19.12. God is not in the rough, fiery spirit, but in the peaceable spirit. A fourfold peace. There is a fourfold peace that we must study and cherish. First, an economical Peace, peace in families. It's called the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 3. Without this, all drops in pieces. Peace is a girdle that ties together members in a family. It's a golden clasp that knits them together and they do not fall in pieces. We should endeavor that our houses should be houses of peace. It's not fairness of rooms makes a house pleasant, but peaceableness of dispositions. There can be no comfortableness in our dwellings till peace be entertained as an inmate into our houses. Number two, there's a parochial peace where there's a sweet harmony, a tuning and chiming together of affections in a parish. When all draw one way, and as the apostle says, are perfectly joined together in the same mind, 1 Corinthians 1.10. One, one jarring string brings all the music out of tune. One bad member in a parish endangers the whole. 
Be at peace among yourselves, 1 Thessalonians 5.13. It's little comfort to have our houses joined together if our hearts be asunder. A geometrical union will do little good without a moral union. Thirdly, there is a political peace, peace in city and country. This is the fairest flower of a prince's crown. Peace is the best blessing of a nation. It's well with bees when there is a noise, but it is best with Christians when, as in the building of the temple, there is no noise of hammer heard. Peace brings plenty along with it. How many miles would some go on pilgrimage to purchase this peace? Therefore the Greeks made peace to be the nurse of Pluto, the god of wealth. Political plants thrive best in the sunshine of peace. He maketh peace in thy borders, and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. Psalm 147.14 Peace makes all things flourish. The ancients made the harp the emblem of peace. How sweet would the sounding of this harp be after the roaring of the cannon. All should study to promote this political peace. The godly man, when he dies, enters into peace. Isaiah 57, 2. But when he lives, peace must enter into him. And number four, there is an ecclesiastical peace, a church peace. When there is unity and verity in the church of God. Never does religion flourish more than when her children spread themselves as olive plants round about her table. Unity in faith and discipline is a mercy we cannot prize enough. This is that which God has promised, Jeremiah 32, 39, which we should pursue, Zechariah 8, 18 to 23. St. Ambrose says of Theodosius, the emperor, that when he lay sick, he took more care for the church's peace and for his own recovery. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, mp3s and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.